Welcome again in the book of Judges. Not the most well-known book, as we've said before, but a book full of treasures. A book that indeed helps us to understand God's ways and also helps us in our daily life. Learning from the lives and experiences of others. And the judge I have chosen, there are essentially four major uh, judges, Othniel, Deborah, Gideon, and Samson. And these are the judges that we're going to speak about. Thirteen judges in all, one an apostate, in other words, self-appointed Abimelech. But um, the other twelve, composed of basically four major judges, and essentially, essentially, what we might say, eight minor ones. Well, we're going to look at these four major ones. We've already looked at Othniel, the first judge, and what lessons we learned from him. But this time, we're going to look at a woman. Her name is Deborah. And we're told certain things about Deborah. You see, she sat under a palm tree. A palm tree is a symbol of righteousness. And that was a symbol of her rulership. And she ruled uh, Israel. But also, at the same time, there was a king, Jabin, the Canaanites, who oppressed them in another area of the country. And uh, Deborah is married, we're told, to Lapidoth. And there's a reason why the name of the husband is given to show that he was a man of dignity and nobility. And undoubtedly it's to show that Deborah was under submission to him in the matter of the family and so forth. But in the matter of the ministry, no, she had the preeminence because she had the anointing. She had the anointing. And this is something that we have to understand, that God does use women. And they must not be self-appointed. They must not seek to take a position that God has not given. And Deborah certainly was in the situation where she was anointed by God and the whole nation realized, yes, she was a prophetess. She was a prophetess. And obviously, naming her husband, it showed that there was beautiful harmony in the home. And uh, we want to look at Deborah, as I said, you know, sitting under the palm tree and there she gave judgment to the children of Israel they would come with their problems and she with the spirit of counsel would tell them what God's will in the matter was but palm tree speaks of righteousness her rulership was one of righteousness righteousness that apostate Abimelech oh his rulership was just one of complete wickedness. The contrast. Well, something else about Deborah. You know, we are named by God, I think. You know, God chooses our name. God inspires our parents to name us. And uh, Deborah, what does Deborah mean? Well, Deborah actually means a honeybee. A honeybee. You know, honey gives life. But there's something else about a honeybee that I think we should pause for a moment and consider because I think it epitomizes the life of Deborah. What do we know about a honeybee? Well, number one, it's very energetic. Very energetic indeed. And also, it is very well organized. Furthermore, it is fruitful. And also, it takes good care of the children or the young ones. You know, in the case of the young bees. I want to look at these four 
qualifications, first of all, because we do well to consider them, and we do well to cry out to God, Lord, develop them in our own lives. First of all, energetic. Well, you know, the Word of God has got much to say about diligence. You know, Moses would cry out, Teach us, O Lord, to number our days and to apply our hearts to wisdom. Paul would say, Let us redeem the time. The Apostle Paul could write and say, Look, I work harder than all the others. Well, King Solomon was full of wisdom, but didn't necessarily walk in it. He says much about diligence. He said the diligence. The hard worker, the one who applies himself, shall not stand before mean men, but shall stand before men of distinction. In other words, he will be singled out. That was a case of Jeroboam who was the first king of the northern tribes of Israel. King Solomon saw him as a young man and that he was diligent. And because of his diligence, his energy, then Solomon appointed him to be a ruler over his tribe. Well, energetic. You know, we need to cry out to God, Oh, may I be diligent. The hard worker is going to get the fruit. You know, it's interesting, but uh, the warnings against slothfulness. The person who does not work during harvest is not going to reap the fruit. But also, the word of God is very clear. The person who does not sow in springtime is going to have no harvest either. And it's no good him saying, well, it's snow is coming or the rain is coming. He has to go out there and perform that duty if he's going to get a harvest. And you know, again, King Solomon speaks of the slothful, saying, well, there's a lion, there's danger. I can't go out. The slothful has always got an excuse why he should not indeed work. You know, there was a... shall I say, a nation, within a nation, in another country that we visited, that, that's as vague as I can be, because I don't want to reveal names. But uh, this nation, within the other nation, was very indolent. And uh, there was a certain situation where there was a rainstorm. And the rain was coming through the roof. And a visitor said to the husband, the man of the house, well, aren't you going to do something about that hole in the roof? And the man said, oh, no, it's raining. Well, he visited the house later on. The sun was shining. And he said, "Uh, aren't you going to mend that hole in the roof? And the man said, oh, no. He said, the sun is shining. It's quite all right. The slothful have always got an excuse. We want to be different. We want to be energetic. And you see, another thing is we have to be well organized. One of the things I've learned is this, that if you're going to accomplish things in life, you have to have a very good infrastructure. In other words, what God gives you to do, you cannot possibly accomplish by yourself. You have to have teams of people. You have to have people in many countries helping you. Well, unless you have a good infrastructure, nothing is going to be accomplished. People have to know, you know, what the job description is. They have to be given the tools to be able to do it. They have to be given the vision and told how to do things. Otherwise, nothing is accomplished. You have to have a good infrastructure. You have to be well organized in other words your day you've got to look at the priorities you don't want to be caught up in the incidentals of life if you do you're not going to accomplish things and that is one of the lessons the Lord taught us in John 15 
He said, look, the branch is producing fruit. He said, I'm going to prune so that the main thrust of life flowing through the branch is going to produce the fruit I want to. And so we have to ask the Lord, what are our majors, what are our minors in life? You don't major on the minors and you don't minor on the majors. Otherwise, the end of a life you've accomplished very little indeed. So there we are. There are some of the things. And then the other thing uh, about the honeybee, which is very interesting, you see. It is fruitful. It is fruitful. And the Lord in John 15 says, look, I want you to bring forth fruit. More fruit and much fruit. And as we produce much fruit, we glorify God. And so we want to be very fruitful people, which if we're energetic, well organized, we will be. Minoring on the minors, majoring on the majors. Well, we move on. There's another interesting point about the honeybee. And that is this, that it takes good care of the young. Now you might say, well, that's fine. Uh, how does that affect me? How does that affect my ministry? Oh, it does. Do you know this? That when you die, the first thing you'll be asked by the Lord, that's assuming you're going to heaven, which I hope you are, and I hope you've accepted Christ as your Savior, because that's the only way. He is the door. And unless you go through that door, and stay on the path, you're not going to heaven. But I'm assuming that you're wise, you're sensible, and you've asked the Lord to forgive you your sins, and come into your heart, that you're born again, you're on the way to heaven. But now, what happens? You're going to meet the Lord. Do you know, we had a lady in our church, and she came from another church and uh, she got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and she developed, she became a Bible school student and she developed into a fine teacher, an excellent teacher. And we opened up doors, many doors for her to teach and it meant a lot to her. But there was one flaw in her life. You know, uh, I was invited to her house with my secretary and, you know, there was her son, not following the Lord, dissolute and so forth. He said, you know, my daughter's the same, divorcing her husband and walking in a way that she should not. Well, I had a vision of her when she died. And there she was, being escorted up to heaven to face the Lord. You know what the Lord said? The first thing he said, what about your children? What about your children? I have known so many ministers who have indeed worked hard, looked after others, but their own vineyard, their own family, they have not cared for. The result is their children have become bitter. And how many pastors' wives have become bitter and disillusioned because a husband is one thing in the pulpit and another thing at home. No, as we understand from the honeybee and as we understand from Deborah, she certainly cared for her family. Well, those are the points that we start out with. And then with the next fact we come to is this, that the children of Israel are in rebellion. Although uh, a number of them are coming to Deborah and consulting her, yet many are in rebellion. And now the prophetess is anointed by the Lord and she speaks forth the word. And uh, she says... Has not God spoken that he will deliver you from King Jabin of the Canaanites and from his captain Sisera? They were very cruel men and they mightily oppressed the Israelites. But you see, nothing could be done 
until God spoke. And God spoke through Deborah. And uh, she called under the anointing of God, God choosing, a certain man, Barak. And what does Barak mean? <laughs> it means a thunderbolt. And she said to Barak, you are to be the captain you are to gather the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali and they were in the north you see towards the Sea of Galilee and that's where the oppression was coming from and you are to go to Mount Tabor and there I'm going to draw that is the Lord I'm going to draw the Canaanites down into the river Kishon which is just below Mount Tabor and I'm going to give you the victory. I am going to give you the victory. Well, Barak made a very interesting statement then. He said, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you won't, I won't go. Uh, Barak wanted the help of a woman. No, no, no. Now that isn't the implication at all. The implication is that he wanted the anointed one to be with him. In other words, he wanted to be sure that the one who carried the anointing, who was ruling Israel in effect, would be with him. You know, Moses said the same thing, Lord, if you don't go up, I'm not going up. In other words, we want the presence of God to go with us when we are to undertake the work of God and that is what we pray in our churches oh Lord you know at the beginning oh let thy presence come we don't want to step into the pulpit without the presence of God and when we are given a work to do by God we certainly don't want to do it unless God is with us so that's what Barak was doing and it was a very wise man actually so he comes you see comes and because the anointing of Deborah is there and Barak is moving under that anointing, then Zebulun and Naphtali hear the voice of God and they assemble themselves from 10,000 men on Mount Tabor. Now, there's a very interesting statement that Deborah makes before, if I could say this, uh, she gives the word to Barak to move. And she said, now look, this victory will not be for your honor. But God is going to give the honor to a woman. And I think the reason there was twofold. We'll look at it in a moment. But basically, it was that, you know, Barak could not boast, or the soldiers could not boast, that by their own strength, they had gotten them the victory. Now, we want to look at uh, the situation here. Here is Barak on Mount Tabor with 10,000 troops. Deborah says, God will bring the enemy down into the valley. And the captain will be that cruel captain, Sisera. And he'll bring all his chariots of iron, about 900 of, bring them down into that valley. And God will give you the victory. Well, Barak, charged with the Spirit of God now, comes down. Comes down. And he gets the victory. But of course, you know, a victory is really only sealed when the captain is captured or killed. Well, Sisera, seeing that the battle was turning against him, jumped off his chariot and fled on foot. Now, we have another very interesting uh, truth here that we must learn. The place that he was running to was governed or inhabited by Heber, and he was uh, of the, uh, shall I say, uh, family of uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. 
Now, he had separated himself from the Israelites and he had made a covenant with the Canaanites. It's a terrible situation. You know, people often separate themselves from the people of God and make alliances with the world, alliances with the wicked people. And Heber thought, well, that's fine, I'm at peace, he won't trouble me, and so forth. But he was not a godly person. But Heber had a wife, and his, her name was Jael, J-A-E-L, Jael. And uh, she was godly. And she had a heart for God. Well, Sisera comes running. And Jael comes out and says, My Lord, come into my tent and rest. And uh, Sisera, knowing that Heber is at, uh, a friend of his, an ally of his, comes in, you see, to the tent. And uh, Jael says, why don't you drink some milk? You know, warm milk is very soothing, send you off to sleep. Cicero was dead tired and soon, being covered by Jael with a blanket, he was fast asleep. But she was godly. And here is how God was going to give the victory to Israel. She took a tent pig and placed it very softly just above his temples and then with a hammer drove that tent pig right through his temples and there he died she comes out and here is Barak who is pursuing Sisera not knowing where he is and she said oh my lord come in here is the one that you have sought well the victory was given to a woman and here are things that we must understand God chooses whom he will choose. In some situations, he chooses men, mostly men. But there are occasions in the word of God when God will choose women. And we as men must recognize when the anointing of God is upon a woman. For example, Catherine Coleman, I knew her. I mean, the anointing was upon her. You wanted to be with her. The presence of God was with her. He had chosen Catherine Corwin to heal the sick. And so you see, you honor the anointing, the mantle that God gives a person, whether man or woman. And certainly, Deborah had the anointing, and Jael was the one selected by God to bring the victory to Israel. And so we have to recognize these things. And, uh, you know, after this great victory, Deborah and Barak sing, if I could say this, a duet. And there's a whole chapter on it. But it praises God and thanks God for the victory. One of the things we have to learn in life, you know, and it was brought out in the Gospels, here are lepers who come to the Lord and uh, ask him to heal you know ten lepers and the Lord said go your way you're healed well they went their way they were healed and one of them turned back and came back to the Lord and thanked him thanked him and the Lord said well where were the others and then he said to this one you know Go, as it were, I'm paraphrasing it, go with my blessing. He got something else. You know, one of the things we've got to understand is this, that when we have children, uh, we teach them at a very early age. When they ask for something and they receive it, they are to say thank you. It is to be a way of life. From two, three, four years of age, We stress this point. You must say thank you. Well, you know, that's what Deborah and Barak did. 
they thanked the Lord. Their song was one of thankfulness. And Deborah actually made an allusion to another judge, Shamgar, who was before her, and said, you know, in his days, the villages were deserted because of the oppression of the enemy. But she said, when I came as a mother in Israel, and see, that is the character of Deborah. She came as a mother, a mother full of comfort, kindness, you know, cares for the children, the honeybee who cares for the young. Well, she came as a mother. And you know, that's what we need also in the church, don't we? Fathers and mothers in Israel. And she said, when I came as a mother in Israel, you know, God changed the whole nation and the nation came into rest and came into safety. And you know, that's what the Lord said to is concerning Jerusalem. I'd like to be like a mother hen to, you know, protect you under my wings. And that's what we want to be. Fathers and mothers who protect the young. May God grant that we will learn much from Deborah and that we will be energetic, well organized, fruitful, and that we will care as a father and mother for the young. And then you know, we will receive, you know, that combination from the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. God bless you.